Well, now to the January 6 hearings. We've heard powerful testimonies from those impacted by the attack on the Capitol, including last Thursday when the hearings recounted how insurrectionists called for the hanging of Vice President Mike Pence. One person following closely is Olivia Troy, former Homeland Security and counterterrorism advisor to Vice President Pence. She joins Michelle Martin to discuss the pressure that Trump put on Pence, the danger to his life, and what the GOP must do to mitigate domestic terrorism. Thanks, Fiona. Olivia Troy, thank you so much for talking with us. Thanks for having me. You know, your career has been devoted to counterterrorism and national security. And I'm imagining that your kind of worldview training in that space didn't really envision American citizens attacking the Capitol with a sense of entitlement. And I'm just wondering how you're processing that, and especially now that you're reliving it again through these hearings. Yeah, it's been horrifying. It's been horrifying to see the footage and uh, to hear the words that if they would have found my former boss, Mike Pence, they would have killed him. Um, the fact that, that that group of people came 40 feet from the sitting vice president of the country and his staff and his family, and also just the footage of, of, of and, and the communications that took place with these groups, which I think we're, the, the committee is still going to, hopefully, will we'll bring that forward more to fruition. It's just the extent of coordination that happened between a branch of government, a sitting president, his people, with a group of extremist groups that I never thought I'd ever see in our country, right? This is something that you see in foreign countries. You see this um, in failing democracies at times. Uh, at, at, like you said, as a national security person, we watch this kind of thing happen overseas. And I think for many of us in national security, it's an appalling to watch this unfold here domestically, especially because that threat lives on. These groups are still out there um, coordinating. They're in our communities. In many cases, they've attended school board meetings um, or they're very active in local Republican parties right now. Some of these people um, that were there that day on January 6th are running for office. And why wasn't there fencing? I've got to tell you, that still bothers me today, having been working inside the White House and watching the fencing go up and all the security precautions that happened in the summer of 2020. I woke up on January 6th and was confused by the images of no barriers, no fencing, no, no precaution was set up when this was going to clearly be a um, very heated situation, given everything that we've been seeing online. I've been out there warning publicly. And so all of these things, um, I think, have been just very hard to watch as a national security person, especially someone who in more recent years focused on the homeland, homeland space. So I want to dig into a couple of things that you've raised here, the first being your former boss the former vice president. You know, it's, it's look, it's not a secret that he's been both an object of fascination and some derision, uh, depending on where you sit, over the many years that he served in the Trump administration. But he now knows and cannot deny that the president that he served so loyally was willing to see him die and his family. And, and I just think it's really, I think a lot of people have a hard time understanding why he has had so little to say about that. Can you explain it? Yeah, I, I think that it would be better for the country to hear from Mike Pence himself. I um, I have actually, I've wanted him to come forward uh, right in the immediate aftermath of January 6th. I think it would have done um, a great deal of good to walk back the stolen election lies that still live on today, um, to come forward right away and say, look, this is, this is wrong. Um, this is dangerous for our country. We've got to stop heading this direction. But he hasn't. And I think it's just um, I think that shows you where a lot of the Republican leaders right now believe that the face of the Republican Party is. And I think for Mike Pence, I think he is hoping to run for president in 2024. That's the likelihood that he will. And I think he's trying to balance uh, how does he sort of walk a fine line here in terms of where the Republican Party's voters are um, in terms of what they think, where they think the voters are. Um, and. What does that mean for his future to come forward? Does he let his staff continue to speak for him, which clearly Thank Greg Jacob, who worked very closely for him, was his lawyer, and Mark Short, were there with him in the moment. And so I think that they're communicating a lot of, of what went on. Is it more powerful to hear from Mike Pence directly? I think it would be. I think there's a whole group of voters out there who I think would would it would resonate. And I think, you know, 
you can't discount him. You can't say that this is a mischaracterization of the events that happened when these are Republicans speaking up, right? Mike Pence is a lifelong conservative Republican who is put at great risk by Donald Trump. But I'm asking you, can you explain why he seems so unwilling to speak up when he did the hard thing already? I mean, the hard thing was to resist yes. these entreaties. The hard thing was to say no and to say no to the president's face. And clearly, he's not a person, the former president doesn't want to hear no when it comes to his agenda, whatever it may be. So he did the hard thing. But what he won't do is talk about it publicly or talk about his state of mind. But I'm, I'm wondering if you can help us understand him. Yeah, I think, honestly, I think it's a political calculation. Uh, I think that he he is trying to appease a base, a base that already considers him a traitor for the majority of it. Um, and I think he's trying to walk a fine line between continuing to um, sort of alienate that base, which he thinks he will need in a 2024 presidential election. So I really do think it comes back to politics. Um, and I would say in this moment, um, what more have you got to lose? You've already lived this. Your life has been put at risk. I think it matters more to put the country over anything else right now. Why do you think so many people want to believe this? Because, because clearly the protagonists here couldn't accomplish this, you know, on their own. And it, it, the, the, the success of this demagoguery rests on the willingness of other people to believe it and to follow along. Do you have a sense of like, why are so many people willing to buy into this? What is the appeal? Do you have any sense of that? I think in a lot of cases, it's been a sense of belonging is what you see a lot of times with populations um, that kind of get disenfranchised and they find a cause and um, they're preyed upon by a lot of these groups. I mean, there's a lot of recruitment going on in chat channels and the dark web and more um, alternate websites where they're radicalizing people and they're telling each other lies. And look, um, the other aspect is, is that foreign adversaries really exploit moments like this as well. So we've opened the apparatus to enable foreign actors to move in and encourage these narratives. That's one of my concerns going forward for this election in the fall is as the stolen election and these um, sort of divisive narratives get pushed out by our own people, by our own Americans, by Republicans out there who are pushing this or candidates that are pushing this kind of thing, foreign adversaries will come in and also encourage that kind of thing. And I can tell you, this is like the right playing ground for them. Um, this is the best thing that could happen to them because it's Americans attacking each other. Uh, and they will they will do their best to amplify those messages and create division. And that's my concern going into November, to be honest. And I think that's important for Americans to understand that you, you, you may think that you're talking to a fellow American sometimes in these situations, but you have to understand that there are bad actors um, like Russia and other countries that want to exploit this moment. Uh, and I think that is the equally dangerous part of all of, all of this is that they want another ge generation to happen. Um, that plays in, to their favor. And so um, I think that is that is where, again, we get back to our democracy being in peril because not only is it happening domestically here and we worry about what is happening mm -hmm. in terms of the dynamics here, it is also... Um, a, a situation where we know that the foreign ad that our foreign adversaries are taking full advantage of this. What should happen now? Because I see the other thing that stands out is it's not just that you know that the, your former boss, the former vice president Mike Pence, has been so reluctant to have very much to say about this, but there's an entire generation of foreign policy uh, leaders, Republicans, who have had very little to say. What is your responsibility at a time like this? And what is their responsibility at a time like this? What do you want to see happen? I mean, my in, in an ideal world, which I, I, you know, given the factors that we're seeing and the ongoing characterization of this, um, I don't think will come to fruition. But I think it's important for Republicans to say enough and take a stand, start speaking up. I mean, it's one thing to have these conversations behind closed doors. Uh, you know, I heard some reporting earlier today where Republicans are talking about how effective the hearings have been 
about presenting just a factual evidence. Uh, but it, then it's important to come forward and take a stand and stop having these private moments. I, I, I've been there where people have a lot of these closed door conversations about how concerning something was that Trump was doing while he was in office. Well, here we are, we're years later, and we are still being intimidated and bullied by this one man who completely controls the Republican Party right now. And I say this as a lifelong Republican, where you know we should be supporting the Liz Cheney's who took a stand. We should be supporting mm -hmm. uh, you know, the individuals that are principled that voted to convict Trump in the impeachment because they were in the right. I mean, they did it based on facts and they knew that what had happened was wrong, but instead they have pushed these people out of the party and these people have suffered the same threats that many of these individuals that are the witnesses in these hearings are mm -hmm. facing today and have faced. And so I think it's part of it is, is it fair maybe um, that you don't want to bring the wrath of Donald Trump and others mm -hmm. um, of this extremism towards you and you don't, you don't want to incur that. But at some point I would say, uh, Donald Trump has shown no loyalty to anyone. I mean, right? Mike Pence is a testament to that, that there is absolutely no loyalty. It is a one-way street when it comes to him, and he continues to destroy what the Republican Party was before. And so I think for our country and for our democracy, it matters. And, it, it, and they should be taking a stand, and they should be calling this out and saying no more. But I just don't see watching Kevin McCarthy, um, watching, honestly, the Republican National Committee and the type of tweets and rhetoric that they espouse and put out and they mischaracterize their hearings, even though it's all facts and it's Republicans in their own words, it's clear that they've made a decision that this is where they think their voting base is and that is where they're going to cater to it, regardless of what that means for our country. And maybe th this goes beyond your sort of wheelhouse of national security uh, training, but it is sort of puzzling to you ask these people, like, what if the shoe were on the other foot? Would you consider this acceptable conduct? And, 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 and it, it would be outrageous to them, right? Yeah, I thought that was a very good point. That, so why, I guess I'm just curious, like why they don't see in, in, in throughout the Republican Party apparatus, throughout the apparatus, they don't see that if you don't have a country run by law, you have a country run by violence or whoever might makes right. And why don't they, why isn't that more persuasive? I'm wondering to people other than yourself and former staff members like yourself. That's what I'm so sort of puzzled by. What do you, do you have a theory about that? Yeah, uh, look, I, I think all of these people know better. They know the truth, they know the reality, and they know that it's a double standard. But right now they have decided that this is a moneymaker because they have been fundraising mm -hmm. off of this. That's one thing that we all need to remember is that they're still taking people's hard earned money based on a lie and based on something that has now been shown that they knew was illegal. They know that it's not true, um, but they have been able to fundraise off of it, which honestly is one thing that just really makes me upset is just thinking about the fact that they continue to take from a lot of these individuals who have bought into this whole thing. And so a lot of it, it's, it's a double standard. There's no way around that, right? And so in this moment now, the power of this whole machine that they have, where it's an echo chamber and the power of disinformation, is that we may see the Republican Party shift later on and flip the narrative on its head when it's convenient for them, which we have seen them do. Is there anything in particular you're looking to see as these hearings continue that you would point us to? You know, I think um, I, I want. I, I think it would be powerful if Pat Cipollone would come forward. He was uh, the president's lawyer, and he, uh, as has been stated in the hearings, um, it sounds like he really uh, took objection to this um, and threatened to quit at times. So, what really happened there? Um, I also think it would be important to hear from some of the White House staff, um, especially those that work directly for Mark Meadows. Uh, so that they can share how this all unfolded and what they saw. I think details like that matter because I think these are, you can't discount the fact that this is someone who lived it, right? And I think it's their, their, their firsthand witnessing of what happened and the extent of how many people knew, which we are seeing um, in these hearings, how many people were aware 
that this was all a lie and that it was wrong and that they tried to stand up to this individual or at least tell him at times. But then in the end, some of these people made a conscious decision to double down on it, right? Which is what you see with Eastman. He keeps coming back and saying, okay, uh, sorry about that attack that almost killed you. But can you go on and do this now? Can you still go on, even though it led to the death of law enforcement officers and hurt many and put you in danger as well to Mike Pence, but you're mm-hmm. still going to do this, right? I mean, just to, to, to see that develop and hear these stories firsthand, I think is important. So I'll be looking for that. I mean, obviously, the, the, the current moment is, is very disturbing. If you, if you adhere to a certain set of values, right? If you adhere to a certain set of values that believes that you know, elections should matter, that, you know, foundational concepts should prevail, um, that democracy has some meaning. It's a difficult moment, but is there anything that you see in this moment that suggests a way forward? I think, you know, I I hope that um, it, it's going to come down to voters and Americans who are paying attention and listening. And while I know Um, There's a lot of talk about the hearings and how, you know, it's an echo chamber. Nobody's going to, they're not going to break through. Uh, I don't, I don't agree with that, actually. I think that these hearings are, have been effective in terms of being very factual um, in a, in a bipartisan way. And to the point of Republicans, like I think back to Watergate, the Watergate scandal, right? And the Republican caucus really stood by Nixon uh, when those hearings began, I think it was in the spring of 1973. And it it took until July of the following year for them to finally break. And so all I can hope is that there's a crack in the foundation here of hoping that a lot of these Republicans have this come forward. They, I mean, look, we know that they want to pivot from Trump, a lot of them, right? Behind closed doors, they despise him. I do. I, Mitch McConnell is not a fan, um, but will they do this publicly and start to move the party in a different direction is yet to be seen. But but maybe um, I, I want to hope that that will be the case because it's better um, for our country. Um, and like the reality is we should never have someone be above the law, no matter how rich you are, no matter how powerful, no matter who it is accountability and justice matters. That is the foundation of our country. And so I think, I I hope that there will be accountability as these facts continue to come to fruition. I love you, Troy. Thanks so much for talking with us once again. Thanks for having me.